Hello everyone, welcome back. This is History with Hilbert here, and today I'm making a response video to Alternate History Hub, who yesterday made a video called What If the American Slave Trade Never Existed? And in this video, I don't want to be rude to Alternate History Hub. I thought his video was really interesting, and that's why I'm making this one. And he does actually make a lot of very interesting videos about sort of alternate history, what would have happened if this hadn't have happened, or if it had gone this way. And in this video, again, I agreed with a lot of the things that he said in his video but I did disagree with a few things and I wanted to expand on a few other ones because I thought you might find it interesting. So I would recommend that you go and watch his video perhaps before watching this one or definitely if you do watch it afterwards because that was the inspiration for making this response video. One question that I did have whilst watching Alternate History Hub's video was, how much wealth did the African slave trade actually generate for European nations? Because he seems to make out that it's this huge portion of wealth, like this house of cards situation, where if you take away the wealth generated by the slave trade, Europe would essentially be blitzed back into the Dark Ages. But I'm going to challenge this theory because I've had a look at a few other theories where really different conclusions are uh, achieved. So, for example, Stanley Engelman, an economist, calculated that th with the most favorable odds, so potentially all the best that they're getting as much money as possible, that in any year of the Industrial Revolution, only 5% of the British economy was garnered through slavery. And, you know, the British were one of the nations who had the most slaves, I think the most after the Spanish and possibly the Portuguese. So if they weren't profiting that much, you know, 5% on the whole isn't that much, uh, especially not the whole House of Cards situation that's being made out to be, then it really wasn't that lucrative at all. And actually, there are a lot of costs involved in the slave trade. Now, if we look at the slave trade as a whole, you've, of course, got the core profit from cash crops. But then you've also got to buy the slaves. A lot of slaves would die on the way. You have to transport them. This all costs money, captains, slavers, and the price of feeding them on the way back. These are all costs that had to be included in the equation. If we look at all of these individual costs and add them up, then quite a lot of the time, the core profit from cash crops, which was very large, comes into a sort of balance with the uh, expenses and then you only have a rather smaller profit margin than first thought. Now of course many Europeans did make a lot of money from the slave trade and became incredibly wealthy. And with these ideas and theories that I'm putting forward here I'm not trying to downplay the horror of the slave trade. The slave trade and the Atlantic slave trade in particular was morally reprehensible. It was absolutely awful for the Africans involved who were taken away as slaves. But that doesn't mean that we can't revise how much and the scale when looking at it economically, which is why I'm challenging Alternate History Hub's view that indeed the slave trade did add so much money to the European economy. It certainly added a lot of money, but whether this would have stopped events happening, which did happen in Europe, I, I would doubt. Now, as well, you see that the slave slavery might not have been the economically the most successful system. And you might be thinking, well, of course it is, because you get a load of people, you force them to work very hard, you don't pay them, so it's a win-win. You get loads of material in, and you don't have to pay anything out. But of course, you do have to feed the slaves, you have to house them, you have to close them. If they ever get injured or die, you have to replace them. And I know this it sounds awful saying it like that, but chattel slavery, they were treated like property. But actually, the British found on West Indian plantations that they were making more money and they were more profitable after slavery had been abolished. And I'm going to look into this a little bit later on in the video as well. Now, another thing that he says is that, you know, uh, major European events wouldn't have happened if the, the slave trade hadn't existed because they simply couldn't have funded them. But I would very much disagree with this because you have a lot of nations like Sweden, Prussia, Austria, Poland, Lithuania and Russia, huge players on the European scene. You know, you've got the Northern War, you've got between Prussia and Austria, you've got all these different things going on. Absolutely huge players on the European scene. And yet none of these nations had any sort of investment in the slave trade. None of them profited from it. They didn't have empires and they didn't have plantations abroad. Yet these were the biggest players in Europe, maybe bar France, Spain and the, the United Kingdom. 
so I would very much argue against that line of thought that nothing would really happen. And again, they all fielded huge militaries. Uh, you've got here the Prussian army, you've got the Austrians were a force to be reckoned with, and of course the Northern War, which I mentioned already. I disagree with alternate history hope when he says that Africa at this time was some kind of apocalyptic hellscape. Now although the changes to the demographics which are natural when 10 million Africans were taken during the slave trade uh, are going to be large and there were several effects for example the economy in West Africa changed majorly because of course you've got all these people going from traditional trades so ivory or gold or silver or copper and they're all moving on to the slave trade then you get very different economic situations. I don't think we should be maybe overemphasizing this because it wasn't as large as some people make it out to be. Now if we look at the population change from the century from 1750 to 1850 then you can see that both European and American populations they boom, they increase rapidly. However the African population stagnates it doesn't really change very much and definitely not in league with europe and america now this is partially due to the uh, civilization advancing much faster in europe europe and uh, america however it does have a part to play with the slave trade that these advances weren't being made in Africa, although in 1900, from 1850 to 1900, after the slave trade has been mostly abolished, we do see that the population begins to increase again. So demographically, yes, the slave trade did have an effect, but this isn't taking into account any other factors. For example, uh, expansion of European colonization in Africa, or famine, or drought, or African civil wars, or the fact that European and American populations were expanding because of technological advancements and things like ar um, architectural, architectural, no, uh, agricultural uh, advancements as well during this time. It's important to remember as well that it was called the slave trade for a reason because the Europeans were trading with coastal African kingdoms who were the ones who went out and captured the slaves and then traded it on. Now slavery probably has its earliest roots in Africa. This definitely wasn't the first time slavery had gone on in Africa. It had been going on for centuries and it was a part of the African economy. But essentially with the transatlantic slave trade you get mass slavery which is just uh, uh, slavery but then on another level many many more because people were being introduced to these African kingdoms with things like gunpowder, guns, uh, reinforced metals, this kind of thing that the Europeans were trading with them for slaves. So all of these other commodities like I said like ivory and gold things like that they were being traded less because slaves were where the profit was. And a lot of these coastal kingdoms, for example the kingdoms of Mali and Benin, became very rich during this period, very wealthy indeed, and technologically superior because as you can see this guy here is carrying a flintlock, these are probably Portuguese traders, and they would expand and these coastal kingdoms would become very powerful. Now if slavery didn't exist, then it's possible that these coastal kingdoms would have been a lot less prominent during this period and you might have seen some larger African kingdoms, because for them it wasn't really is important to expand inland because that's where they caught their slaves. Generally the slaves who would be caught would be from tribes further inland who would be uh, captured by slavers from these other tribes and oftentimes these coastal kingdoms would be capturing people in battle and then selling them on as slaves and that's essentially how the African slave trade worked in Africa. If we're following this scenario to the end we also have to question whether the scramble for Africa would actually happen when the vast majority of Africa was divided between European powers because the scramble for Africa although it wasn't for slaves did play a huge part on the modern history of Africa and I think much more than the slave trade is why Africa is still one of the poorest continents on the planet and why its people mostly live in poverty.
Now, if it didn't happen, then there are a few things that wouldn't have happened as well. And I actually think some of the worst atrocities committed by Europeans uh, in Africa and to African people were done during this period of, I think it's called second imperialism in Africa. For example, you've got things like uh, the Boer concentration camps. You've got the crushing of various rebellions in German East Africa. You've got human zoos. You've got people whose limbs were being cut off because they weren't working fast enough on plantations in Africa, which sounds an awful lot like a different institution which I've mentioned already. So you see that a lot of the horrors committed in Africa were done during the second period. And whether this would have happened in this alternate scenario if they, for whatever reason, didn't take slaves is unknown. Now, it wasn't for the reason of slavery that the second imperialism happened, the scramble for Africa. It was, in fact, uh, to gain some of the raw materials, for example, diamonds or gold and things of the like in Africa as the uh, prices were falling from other areas like the Indies and also for national prestige having a place in the sun, it was called. Now, as well, we have to question whether slavery was actually economically the best way forward. And this is something that I'm not sure um, Alternate History Hub looks at in his video, which I thought would be an interesting inroad, because we have to look at, well, the, our history is the one where slavery happened. And we tend to think, well, yeah, slavery, it's, it's economically, we became incredibly wealthy as Europeans because of the slave trade. Now, I've already looked into this earlier, but was it actually the best way forward economically speaking. And actually, there have been a few studies which suggest that it wasn't. Now, this study that I'm going to look at by John Elliott Kens is looking specifically at the southern United States, so the area that Alternate History Hub mentions as being a sort of, well, not really a desolate wasteland, but a lot poorer than the north in this alternate scenario, even poorer than it was in actual history, especially after the Civil War. Now, a few things about having slaves to do your agricultural work rather than people who are who are the owners of their own produce is that you get very little development of new farming techniques because, of course, these Africans don't have a choice. They're being forced to work the land. Whereas if they were the ones in charge or if you've got white Europeans who owned the farm or had some vested interest in its success, you'd probably get a lot more innovation as well because liberty is very important to innovation. And if you've got all these people who are being forced to work, it's very unlikely they're going to go, hey, actually, I think it would be better if we did this instead. And then you try things out and then sometimes it works and you get an innovation which leads on to other things and sometimes it doesn't. But you get you don't really get this with slavery. So essentially, the southern agricultural techniques, they stagnated from slavery. Now, in the north, this is different because in the north, you have a lot more industrialization because in the north, you didn't have as much of a slave based economy, or at least it was abolished a lot sooner than in the south. So you had to find new techniques of reaching that peak of having slaves pick your cotton or whatever. So you now start to see factories appearing, industrialization, machinery, mechanics working because you have to keep up with the other markets. And for this reason, the North became a lot more innovative and it had a lot more industrialization, which really helped them in the Civil War and which really bit the Southerners in the bottom in the Civil War because they weren't as industrialized as the North, which might also have come down to having slaves and abolishing them sooner meant you had to make that extra leap to fill in the gap in the profits. I don't think it's very likely that had the African slave trade not brought millions of Africans to North America, that there would be no black people in the United States. I think this is very unlikely, especially given the last 100 years of mass immigration to certain areas of the world. Now, for example, you do see that a lot of Chinese people came to North America, especially to the West Coast, to California during the gold rush from China. And if you look at the distances, it's not it's actually further from the coast than Africa is. Now, of course, there are differences and you've got to say, well, China was probably more uh, established and had links 
with America and the rest of the world than Africa did. And it very much depends on how Africa, what kind of country or uh, countries would be in Africa at the time if this alternate scenario did go ahead. But I think it's likely that if the slave trade hadn't have gone ahead, that quite possibly Africans in America would be seen in a similar light as the Chinese in America, who weren't brought over as slaves, but were brought over as cheap labourers. And I think it's likely that perhaps with projects such as the railroads or uh, with the gold rush or when cheap labor forces were needed, that then just like Chinese people came over and were exploited and faced discrimination, for example, with things like the uh, yellow peril, that perhaps a similar thing would happen with African workers, that they could be brought over on ferries from Africa to the United States to be used as a cheap labor force. Now, I find it very unlikely that there would be no black people. And I think there would be less of a need for a civil rights movement had this been the case because a lot of the things that went on in the civil rights movement were as a direct consequence of slavery. Now of course the Chinese didn't have it easy in America either and they faced discrimination and anti-Chinese riots and things like that and probably this would be exactly the same for black people coming to the United States in this alternate scenario. Although I do think that by today if things had gone the same with the Chinese community and other ethnic communities in the United States that there would still be some sort of achievement of civil rights and I definitely don't think that had it followed a similar course as today that there would be no black people in the United States. So one of the questions that Alternate History Hub asks in his video about the American slave trade it's essentially that what would have happened if Europeans hadn't brought African slaves to the New World. So one of the questions that he asks is where else could they have gotten the manpower from? Now I completely agree when he says that Native Americans weren't a viable option. Of course the Native Americans were the indigenous populations of the Americas so it might make sense at a glance to use them. But there were several problems with this. One was that the Native Americans, they succumbed very quickly to European diseases. Now, this was actually an idea proposed by the Spanish in the New World, who were the first in the New World, especially in South America, places like Peru, Bolivia, Mexico, where they conquered. They tried to get Native Americans to work in the silver and gold mines, but so many of them died of diseases because they, were, they just didn't have the immune system of Europeans. And this is actually why the first African slaves came over, because their immune systems could handle all the diseases whether many Native Americans had died of uh, especially smallpox in the New World, which just wiped out huge numbers. Now, the other option, if we're not looking at Africans, which is what happened in reality, and Native Americans, because they were dying out of diseases, is other Europeans. And actually, this did happen. Indentured servitude is essentially a form of slavery, but it's temporary. Now, there are several differences which I'm going to look into, but lots of indentured servants did actually come to the Americas, and actually about half of all white people from Europe coming to America um, until the American independence and the American Revolution, they were indentured servants, which was quite a large number, 225,000. Now, some differences between chattel slavery, which is the type of slave, uh, black slaves from Africa, and indentured servitude. Now, both were the property of the owner in that they were both essentially then possessions that could be bought and sold. However, indentured servants were more, they'd signed a contract with someone. So often it was that they wanted to go from Europe to the New World, but they couldn't afford the transport from the two places. So what they would do is they would say, I will work for you for X amount of years if you pay for the transport for me to come over to the new world. And although this should be a temporary thing, quite often they would be working for the rest of their lives to try and pay off this debt. And sometimes actually, if they couldn't pay it off in their life, if they had children, then they would have to keep working to pay off that debt. So you can see that although it's it can be seen as a type of slavery. It's not exactly the same as chattel slavery, where uh, you were a slave, you would be a slave for the rest of your life, full stop, unless by whatever miracle you were granted your freedom. If you had kids, they would be slaves as well. And it's involuntary. While indentured servitude is voluntary, you do sign up for it, you do write a contract. It can be just as brutal as chattel slavery. And this was about half of all the people who came to the Americas before the American Revolution. Perhaps in the world of this scenario where no African slaves are taken to the Americas, indentured servants would be signing contracts with perhaps even governments or companies or even individual plantation owners that they would work for several years on plantations 
and that then the workforce on these plantations where cash crops are being produced would be temporary workforces. Another interesting line of thought is the role that penal colonies might play in this post-slavery world because for a large part of Australia's early history it was in fact a British penal colony which essentially meant that if anyone misbehaved in Britain and the authorities couldn't be bothered to keep them any longer they would send them on a convict ship to Australia to an essentially a work camp or a penal colony which explains why Australians are the way they are today, considering these are their ancestors. If penal colonies had been established in America, and if the convicts had, instead of being made to work in Australia and other penal camps, were made to work on the plantations to build up cash crops, then this might be where another workforce could be found. Now, you might be saying, well, that's all well and good, but surely there can't be enough criminals to fill the demand of millions of African slaves over the course of the Atlantic slave trade. Well, no, but there could be other ways of filling in the numbers. Now, for example, the Jacobites in Scotland in Britain rose three times from 1689 to 1745, and after each failed attempt, the British government managed to capture a lot of rebels, especially in 1745 after the last failed Battle of Culloden. Now, if instead of doing what they did, which was hang a few, let most of them go and send some of them to London, if instead they had sent them all to the penal colonies in the Caribbean in North America to work picking cash crops, then you could have seen a very different scenario. Now this is just one because I particularly like the Jacobites and I usually find really obscene and weird ways to include things into videos. Oh, which reminds me, the Netherlands. <laughs> Now that's just the example of the Scottish Jacobites, but perhaps a source of manpower that the British Empire would exploit would be none other than the island next to them, Ireland. And the Irish actually rose on 17 major occasions between 1600 and Irish independence in 1922, including the Wars of the Free Kings, the Fenian Risings and Wolf Tones Rising or the Irish Rebellion in 1798. And you can easily see a British response in a world where they need manpower to be sent to the Caribbean in North America of being looking at a Irish rebellion, prisoners of war, instead of executing them or doing whatever with them or letting them go, sending them to jail, they would simply send them to the colonies in the Americas where they would be put to work producing cash crops. It's interesting that the one that captures the imagination is the transatlantic slave trade to North America and the Caribbean, and that no one ever really talks about the other slave trade. Alright everyone, thanks very much for watching. This has been my response to Alternate History Hub's video about what if the transatlantic North American slave trade hadn't happened. Now, I really enjoyed watching it, and I would again say go and watch the video as well. It's very interesting, a lot of food for thought, and the channel is generally a really good one that I very much enjoy watching whenever he uploads. So yeah, let me know in the comment section below if you agreed, if you had any other opinions, and don't forget to tune in again next time for more History with Hilbert.